Hello, I think we ran, we're ready to go. Hello, hello, everybody. We are back. Yes, we are back. Last night, we had a fabulous conversation with students in Ohio talking about their college and university experiences and why they are standing up for and fighting to have student debt canceled. And I thought, why not come back again and let's wrap this thing on up and broaden the conversation to talk about something that we all should be concerned about or fighting towards for, I should say, which is a 21st century economic bill of rights. And I couldn't think of two better people to get this party started off just right as we talk about the 21st century economic bill of rights. So I have two experts on this most important topic. I have Alan Minsky, who is the executive director of a fabulous powerhouse organization for progressives, Progressive Democrats for America. And I have the one and only Dr. Harvey K, who is an expert on FDR and the New Deal. Right here, they have teamed up to write two op-eds so far, pushing this agenda helping us to understand historically the importance of reviving the spirit of FDR and so many others when it comes to the 21st century economic bill of rights. So we're going to get all, we're going to get into this. How are you both? We were just together this afternoon. It's good to see you again. I told family and friends, this was my Nina day. I love it. I love it so much. And Doc, you know, I need to go ahead. A professor emeritus of democracy and just and justice studies at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And you are an expert in FDR, as I laid out. But let's talk about some of your books. The Fight for the Four Freedoms, What Made FDR and the Greatest Generation Truly Great. Another book, Take Hold of Our History. And another one, Make America Radical Again. And lastly, FDR on democracy. Alan, I don't know. We got a lot of catching up to do with the doc, uh, with the book on the book situation. I've written four books all on sports history. So, but uh, I wrote them about 20 years ago. I cannot compete with that. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, this, we need, you can uh, have a refresher on the sports history. Uh, another, another time. I, I'll, I'll have a refresher on this. When we spoke earlier today, I commented that on how hot it was. And something like a heat dome has fallen over Los Angeles. And it's about 95 degrees right now. It's uh, in Los Angeles. It's 5.30 p.m. I mean, right now, it's like 95 degrees here on April 5th. I'm guessing this probably competes with the hottest April 5th of all time. And this is uh, this is global warming, folks. This is not supposed to happen even in L.A. in April. So that's yes. that's how I'm doing right now. Well, the climate chaos is real. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what you're saying. And, and all of us have to care about that, uh, not just in this country, but all over the world. Mm -hmm. So thanks Nina for letting and I us know. Nina and I enjoy the Great Lakes life. Well, we do. We do. But, you know, the climate emergency and with the decline in U.S. manufacturing and with the research capacity of this country, the United States, we all hear about energy independence and our energy dependence. And the United States of America can free the world with our research university capacity from our dependence on fossil fuel. We need to do this. We have the balance of the world's capital infrastructure for scientific research, which is essential to lift renewable energies to be able to replace fossil fuels. This fits right into the 21st century economic bill of rights, very 21st century component to the economic bill of rights too. You know, some scientists say our very survival is dependent on action on this yep. most important issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. K, do you wanna weigh in on that? Well, I'm not a scientist of that sort. I can tell You're you You're a social that. scientist, though. Social scientist of sort. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I look, for years, I remember actually many years ago, an older colleague of mine started citing me the what was going to happen in the 21st century if we didn't get our act together. And I remember at the time thinking, well, that's just surmise, you know. And then every year that passed, it became ever more evident and the reports became ever more dire as to the imperative of action. And I think just the other day, the, the United Nations issued a severe warning about what, would ha what will happen if we don't take severe action. Yeah, I think a lot of people in power 
I think believe that this is a joke for some reason, but they are definitely have the fate of the world in their hands. Our inaction is going to continue to cause a chaos. We have flooding, we have drought, we have weather occurrences that should not be happening at certain times of the year. And there's a big push and pull factor. So all of the migration and you know, from animals to, to human beings, the upsetting of the ecosystem for animals and plants. This is a real serious matter. And while we're bringing that up, I want to shout out Don't Look Up, which really tackled that. They were nominated, our dear friend, dear friend, uh, David Sirota, and just, it was a wonderful, wonderful movie. If you have not seen that movie, you better go ahead on and go to Netflix, baby, if you have it. And watch that movie. Don't look up. It was phenomenal. I must have watched the thing about 10, 10 times already. And counting. That, that. I don't think I could do that. I The one time alone was 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 powerful enough. But I, I, I sent a note to David after I saw it. And I said, you know, I know everyone thinks this is about climate change and, and the threat. And I have little doubt that that was what, a significant message. But in the light of the politics of this, specifically the politics of these last several years and the upcoming dangers of what our politics, you know, if we don't act politically, we're going to get smashed politically. I also said to him, this was a, a dire warning of fascism at the same time. Oh, agreed. And uh, while we're shouting out David, want to shout out Adam McKay yeah. as well. The two of them teaming up. Powerful. Absolutely yeah. powerful. Yeah, many messages in that movie. Uh, Dr. K, I totally agree. So let's go to the more the the umbrella of of all of this, of which climate chaos fits into, as Alan laid out earlier, the 21st century economic bill of rights. What brought you two together on this powerful mission? I'm honored that yours truly had a chance to to peek into it before it was published and and put a little put a little turner on it here and there. I thank you so much for inviting me to do that. And I am very much a supporter of the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights and am honored and privileged to be on this journey with both of you. But how did this party get started? I'm going to let Alan explain it, but I just yeah. want to let everyone know that we were encouraged, seriously encouraged, by your enthusiastic response to this idea. And, and when we said, have a look at what we're doing, you were more than well, you were, you were very welcoming. And there was a temptation to want to put your name on the piece, just for the record. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you so much. Well, I'm on the team. Well, what had happened was as Harvey was invited by the folks at the Gravel Institute to make a video about uh, the 21st century, about the, sorry, Franklin Roosevelt's um, second, um, it was his second to last uh, State of the Union address in which he unveiled a, an economic bill of rights. So a second Bill of Rights literally would be amendments to the Constitution that would guarantee everybody, you know, the right to a job, the right to health care, the right to housing on down the list that he, he presented. Uh, people have seen the movie uh, Capitalism, A Love Story by Michael Moore it actually ends with the footage of him reading and delivering the second to last State of the Union speech that he gave, which he was too sick at the time to go to the Congress and deliver it. So he delivered it on camera. And um, and so Harvey did this. And I actually was watching a new rule by Bill Maher, who I only occasionally turn to, and I found it so appalling and rather offensive. I was like, okay, progressives need to take Harvey's message and make clear that they stand for something other than to the way that Maher and the right-wing media are caricaturing progressives, okay? We need to make clear that we stand for a different economic social contract, and it is the economic social contract that the American people support. It's all very common sense, just as it was in FDR's time. And so you update it and apply it for the 21st century and you present it and say, OK. And, and, and the thing is, is we just showed in the second piece that we wrote that there's actual legislation introduced by current members of Congress that fit every one of the Economic Bill of Rights. And they are the politicians who would be the natural allies of incoming Congressperson Nina Turner in what will be the 118th Congress. And they have presented and laid out support for every one of the 10 rights that we have in our uh, economic 21st century economic bill of rights. And the Democrat, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party 
and I can, I'll go in a little later about how they fit into the general American political spectrum, but they are presenting and therefore they need a vehicle to elevate this fact about them, which is a central fact about them. Yes, they are warriors for social justice, for racial justice. Yes, they are warriors on the climate emergency. They are right across the board on all of these issues and they are very ingenious right now at presenting very strong public policy proposals, but also central to their project, one that directly connects with the American, the majority of the American people and the overwhelming majority of working class Americans, right, is the economic package that they are presenting and they support. They just need to articulate and lift this message to reach the American people. And now is the time to do it because we, I think, I think Senator Turner may know something about this. We're in a situation where great progressives right now are running for federal offices. They're running for offices all across the country. And in many districts and regions, they're challenging moderate Democrats. And the moderate wing of the Democratic Party is a neoliberal wing of a party that pretty much like all neoliberalism says all of these economic issues, they're going to be determined by the market. Well, we've seen for four decades the results that that produces and they are rotten for the American people. Whereas going back to the core economic message the FDR laid out and then adjusting it and updating it for the 21st century, that is a winning message for these midterms. It's a winning message for our society today. And it really is necessary because we live in a society now where there are just, it's rife with human rights abuses everywhere you look, from the homeless population to the way the pharmaceuticals pour drugs that then people get addicted into the society, the racial injustices, are again still legion across the society and they need to be directly addressed and rectified. And we can do, we can build a majoritarian politics, but we especially have to lift up the economic message because the mainstream media in this country makes sure that this component of the progressive message is not reaching the American people in the way that it needs to because it threatens their very power and their status quo position in the society. We need to elevate this, make it clear, and we think the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights is a great vehicle to present this to the American people, have it be heard, and let them know that we are the political formation that will improve the lives of the American people and make this country what it can be. If Amen I can just say something, I, I, I just, there's, something, there's something I want to add to that, because I, I want us to go beyond the idea that this is merely a wrapping up of an agenda. OK, it's not the wrapping up of an agenda. There has been something missing from Democratic Party politics, from American public debate for decades now. The Democratic Party has had no narrative, no story, no vision that could capture not just the imagination, but could capture the spirit of what it means to be an American that Americans in all their diversity carry with them. And my argument has been, and, and Alan and I have talked about this, the argument needs to be as well that this is the way in which not only the Democratic Party, but also the American people regain a memory, regain a memory of the promise of America, which isn't something that magically appeared to Alan and myself as we did this, but this is something that has been fought for in generation after generation, and there have been figures who have articulated that struggle as a promise. And it so happens that for the sake of the 21st century, I think FDR, with all his faults and failings, with all the things that had to be cut out of the New Deal, especially the question of race, the, the case remains that he offered this Economic Bill of Rights for all Americans, and the idea was that he would use this as a means by which Americans would rally. Labor movement, civil rights movement, farmers and others would rally so that after the war, they could realize the promise that for generations Americans had been fighting for. And it is that promise that we center, uh, not just tonight, but what we are working towards as a coalition that the people of this nation deserve so much more than what they are getting. And what really just kind of uh, gets to my soul is that so many don't believe that they deserve these nice things, that they don't believe that this country has the capacity within a social contract one to another, because that's really what President FDR was laying out, a social contract. And 
Dr. K, you have talked about countless times how in the 1940s, the overwhelming majority of the American people were right with President FDR. And so what we're fighting for is not new. There were generations before us. We are in the fight right now. I call us freedom fighters and there'll be generations after us, but we are tracing the footsteps of some pretty incredible visionary people. And the point, Dr. K, I want you to go back to that point. We talked about it earlier. Talk, give the percentage of Americans who were right with FDR that really represent a cross section of the political spectrum. In other words, it's not just progressives that wanted the agenda that President FDR was laying down. From the very beginning of his presidency in 1933, FDR had in his mind something like an economic declaration of rights. He then presented it in good part in 1941 in terms of the four freedoms that would guide the war effort, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want and freedom from fear. And let me just say that it was A. Philip Randolph on hearing that speech who realized the time was then to strike for a greater place for African-Americans inside of the defense effort and American industry. And he then created, launched the March on Washington movement, which was the, basically the movement that would come to fruition in 1963 in Washington, D.C. So during the war, FDR had already created a commission to consider what should happen after the war in rebuilding America. And they did a survey, surveys in fact, of the American people during 1943. And what they discovered, I'm sure even FDR was amazed that for example, 85% of Americans wanted guaranteed national health care. 85% of Americans wanted the guarantee of a job with a living wage. And, and something in that order definitely wanted aid for students to be able to finish school, go on to university, to go as far as their abilities would take them. And there were a host of other things having to do with the role of labor, okay, and the fact that this should be universal. So he wrote up this 1944 State of the Union message to put into words that vision, that promise. And I have to say that it's important to realize that when he offered it, he did not believe that they would necessarily be able to turn it into law immediately because of the coalition that had been forming in Congress between Republicans and the white supremacist folks who came to be called the Dixiecrats of the Southern states. Yeah. But what he wanted to do was to put into the American mind that this was worth fighting for. So I think that that's important to realize that this is something that the American people themselves wanted that he articulated. And I'll just give a quick extension of that history. A. Philip Randolph himself in the 1960s developed, and since we actually have we actually have video. I want to show it. I love show and tell. A freedom budget for all Americans, budgeting our resources, 65 to 75, or 66 to 75, to achieve freedom from want. And he lays it all out. And it's all laid out in terms of a 10-year plan, really, to operationalize the Economic Bill of Rights. And I, again, I want everyone to know that this was a very popular plan, 150-plus labor leaders, civil rights leaders, academics, university presidents, and foundation heads endorsed it. It seemed like a real possibility, especially in the wake of the launching of the Great Society and War on Poverty initiatives. In 1968, not long before his assassination, Martin Luther King Jr. grabbed hold of all of this, the FDR, the A. Philip Randolph, and he called for an economic bill of rights as part of the poor people's movement. And we also know, those of us who supported Bernie, that in 2019, 2020, Bernie had on his website an outlined 21st century economic bill of rights, which in part and also inspired us to take this, this project up. Yeah, I mean, so the moral of this story is none of this stuff is new that there were generations ahead of us fighting for these same things and that the American people, just like they are today, and Alan, I want you to dip into that. 
the some of the stats that Dr. K laid out, the American people are right where we are, just as they were in the 40s on these particular issues. People might not necessarily identify themselves as progressives, but mm -hmm. when you talk about universal health care, when you talk about making sure that they can afford their prescription drugs, when you talk about having paid family and medical leave, being able to unionize, reforming a legal system, I mean, on and on and on, the majority of the American people are really right there. But before we come on up to the to the present, right in this moment, Alan, I want to go back to something Dr. K said. And, and Dr. K, thank you so much for sharing of that book, A Freedom Budget for All Americans. And just, I just want to enumerate, because we're going to enumerate before we leave here this evening, what is in the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights, but budgeting our resources, as you said, Dr. K, from 1966 to 1975 to achieve key word to achieve freedom from want. And it was the abolition of poverty, guaranteed full employment, full production and high economic growth, adequate wages, farm income parity, guaranteed incomes for all unable to work, a decent home for every American, modern health services for all, full educational opportunities for all, updated social security and welfare programs and lastly, equitable tax and money policies. I swear to you, that sounds just <laughs> like it was written for this particular moment. So when when the folks tell us what we can't not have and what we cannot do, you tell them, oh, yeah, yes, we can. We need more leaders that are willing to have a vision that provides provision for the people. We don't need folks in leadership to tell us what we cannot have and what we cannot do. We need leaders who are ready, willing, and able to make this so, to fight for this. And I think Congresswoman Barbara Jordan encapsulated this whole thing very nicely when she said what the people want is very simple. They want an America as good as this promise. That's what this is all about. Alan, what, you, what say you? Well, the very first one that we have is the, the right to a job um, at a living wage. And this is the idea that if you work 40 hours a week, okay, and we, of course, support that there should be guaranteed vacation as well. But just yeah. holding in on the first one, if you work 40 hours a week at one job, if society, whether it's the private sector or the public sector, which means it's determined through our democratic process, someone works a job. They're working at a living wage. They don't need a second job. I mean, they can go get some extra income if they want to, but they will be able to live a comfortable life at one job. And we, first of all, believe the American people support that notion. Americans right now work multiple jobs to get by. Right now, what, by the way, one of the things historically that's a real paradox of history is the Roosevelt and then the Truman administration, they may have failed to bring forward the sort of statutes of the Economic Bill of Rights within the domestic United States, but they did write a lot of the constitutions of the countries coming out of World War II. And these are largely the uh, other industrialized, technological, prosperous countries. And they have a lot of these things in their society in ways that we don't. We all know that they have, for instance, single payer universal health care. Okay. They have much stronger unions than we have. Uh, they don't really have large homeless populations. They don't really have tens of millions of people or many millions of people who are impoverished at the rate they are in the United States of America. So the model that we're proposing, it's nothing utopian. It exists in the world. It exists all over the world. And there are multiple different models for it, but it does. And it's very attainable. And again, Americans right now are working many, many more hours to get by than the people in the other technological industrial countries in the world. Now, my sense is the American people, there's really no polling on this because the normal status quo has become so entrenched since Reagan, since the Democratic Party basically made, uh, just sort of absorbed the logic of Reaganism with the Clinton administration going forward, that the market would really be the determinant and that the politicians wouldn't interfere with market logic in terms of how the economy was structured, at least not very much, nothing like they would have in the FDR model or the model that we're proposing. But the idea here, a central proposition, you work one job, and I bet if you pulled that idea and you got a living wage off of one job, to do do you think if you work a full-time job, you do, you deserve a living wage? That would pull phenomenally with the American people. 
Now, it's speculative because I don't know many poll numbers because it's sort of been off the charts, but it's such a common sense notion. And it is, as Harvey said, this is visionary. It is presented by some of the people in Congress, but it is definitely something the American people, I think, will love. And it sets forward an idea of participating in the society that isn't how people have been participating. And it's a better life for everybody involved in America. And there's a ripple effect to that to that better life. Wouldn't you say, Dr. K? Yeah. And, you know, there, there's a history is filled with ironies. In 1960, the Democratic Party actually had its party platform outlined in terms of the Economic Bill of Rights. Straightforward announced this will help secure the Economic Bill of Rights that FDR called for. That's in 1960. In the 1970s, the party leadership turned its back on those very ideals and ideas and initiatives. And I think it's important to realize that since I've quoted numbers before, I don't have the exact numbers right now, polling through the 1970s and into the 1980s, despite, despite what people tell us in the media, never changed on those questions. It did not decline. Americans did not become conservative. What happened was they found that their own political leaders were turning their back on the FDR tradition and legacy. Indeed, the A. Philip Randolph legacy, you might say. So what we're proposing in a, in a fashion is clearly 21st century, but it's also in part the redemption of the progressive tradition and perhaps the, pro the redemption of the Democratic Party if we can get people elected and most especially Nina Turner into the Congress to offer her voice and lead the charge on the Economic Bill of Rights. Well, let the redeemed say so. You know I love that word. Uh, Dr. K, because, you know, my spiritual church, black church liberation background, let the redeemed say so. It's just something about that. So let me ask this question, because a lot of people, some people do not believe that the system is rigged. And if they continue to listen to mainstream media and the people who have the ultra, ultra wealth, they will lead you to believe that if you are very successful from an economic point of view, you did everything right and nothing wrong and you're infallible. And if you are on the other side of that, which is to say you're among the poor, the working poor and the barely middle class, your struggle is very much rooted in your deficiencies as an individual. In other words, the system is not rigged. If you are successful, it is all because you are all knowing, almighty, all good. And if you are not successful, particularly from a financial standpoint, something is wrong with you. So here is the question. You know, we talk a lot about a rigged economic system, and oftentimes people don't understand that a rigged economy leads to a rigged political system. What is the connection, the nexus between the two, the tie between those two realities in the United States of America? Well, I, for, just on shorthand, I think oligarchy and democracy, I mean, they're like oil and water. They don't mix. And of course, actually, definitionally, they're two different systems. We basically have a group of American oligarchs at this point, and they have tremendous influence over our political system. And they're not going to want, and they they, they make sure that the politicians they support uh, do not change the structure of our economy. And right now we're at a point in the United States of America, well, certainly before the COVID pandemic, uh, you know, how, by the way, the COVID pandemic still at this hour has shaken things up to a degree that it provides opportunity. We obviously see, right, with this great, the resigning of people from work, the people dropping out of work, the people shifting jobs, the, the, the wave of unionization that's happening across the country. We see in the American people an appetite to demand a different economic social contract. Another reason why it's a great moment to champion a 21st century economic bill of rights. But before the pandemic and the years leading up to it, uh, you would think if we had this like market driven economy in the propaganda of the people who advocate for it, they would say, well, this is how you have social mobility. But you look at the statistics, social mobility is flatlined in the United States of America. There's yes. very little social mobility, very little upward social mobility. You have these very rare instances of people who, and by the way, the Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, they actually are from the generation that they benefited from the FDR social contract. 
when you go forward a few decades, you have very few people even who, I mean, a few people, five people, 10 people might become gajillionaire entrepreneurs. But this is a country of 335 million people. And you look at statistics and yes, social mobility, the whole notion of an American dream has ended. Okay, take it one step further. The American dream uh, as such, uh, this idea that we can be, the next generation will be richer. First of all, the statistics show that's not the case. And the whole, and the, the society's belief in the notion of that as a reality ended with the market crash. And I think what happened preceding the market crash was everybody was buying up houses. They were being offered loans that they couldn't pay back. It was a complete house of cards. People were using their houses as ATM machines and it completely went bust. And they had, they had basically presented the idea of upward social mobility through debt accumulation to households, which of course was always gonna explode on them. It completely exploded on them. And since that time, everybody knows that house that you wanna buy, it's out of reach. You know, young people today, even with two jobs, couples with two jobs, they are finding it almost impossible to own a house, which of course is one of the signature features of the American dream. This is, we, we need an economic reorganization in our society. And we have to get there or cynicism about our democracy, it's gonna even go past where it's been in recent years. I mean, we really, really need to deliver for the American people a belief that our democratic system can provide what they want for themselves in their lives. And right now, it seems like a dead end. And, and I hate to say it, I wanna to talk to this, about this later. It's not just the Republican Party. It's the mainstream of the Democratic Party before the arrival of the new progressives with the Sanders campaign in 2015 and 16. There was no promise of an alternative social economic contract for the American people. But the progressives in 15 and 16, the Sanders campaign, I mean, it has its roots back in Occupy, right? Sure. That was an incredible national rebellion against the economic system. That's what Occupy was. That's right. Yes. So Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, and and. Definitely, I was right there with Senator Sanders in that moment, mm -hmm. as all of us uh, right now on Turner TV, we were right there and it was a quickening and people responded to that. And we saw that response all over the country as thousands of people came to the rallies that were held by the by Senator Sanders all across this country. And that showed the hunger and the desire that people had Number one, to be a part of something that's bigger than them, but also the message, right? That vision to provide provision for the people was very attractive. And that spark, you know, Senator Bernie Sanders was certainly the spark. We are the fire. I'm certainly the fire, baby, of this whole thing. We are the fire and we need more folks standing up to utilize this and and you don't i want folks to know you don't have to have an extra special title to get involved you just don't now we need people with extra special titles and as be, has been laid out in the second op-ed that alan and and dr k have written common dreams is right there i'm hoping we can put some of that up on the screen to make sure but we'll we'll tweet them out we've already have but you can go to nina, at nina turner and see uh the or get a copy see the link to both op-eds that were written by Alan and Dr. K. But this, this is the thing. We need people in those positions that have the extra special titles to push forward those policies. And then those of us who are activists, the people who are engaged, are you are the fire to push people, to make a demand. As, as Brother Frederick Douglass once said, power can seize nothing without a demand. We got to make a demand and there has to be requisite consequence for not meeting the demands of the people. Too many people are suffering right now. Alan, I love the part about we have to see this moment in human history as an opportunity. I often say that there is promise in the problem. And what is the promise that is in this problem? The problem, problem of, of the pandemic, the problem of, of, of inflation, the problem of immense suffering. You know what the promise is? Is that we can go big as hell. Let's go big. Let's go bold. Let's do this thing. Let's not clamp down, baby. This is the time to get it all in there. Yeah, this if I may say, just jump in for a second. Yeah. This is this has been the greatest disruption of day to day American life since at least World War II. So we Absolutely. actually do. We can return right to the moment with FDR's yeah. um, second Bill of Rights and second to last inaugural address because the pandemic was the greatest disruption of day to day life in the United States of America since World War II. It yeah, is I, an opportunity. I, 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 
there's something yeah. else we really ought to consider. When FDR delivered that that proposal, that call for an economic bill of rights, he warned, he warned that Americans should be prepared for right wing reaction. Now, I want to make it clear. He didn't mean only political right wing reaction. He was expecting the corporate bosses. They were the right wing reaction to be feared. And it is the case that they feared that economic bill of rights and what it represented. And there was that serious effort in part bound up with the Cold War to suppress the aspirations of Americans. Now, in the 1960s, there emerged this whole host of dynamic small D democratic movement, civil rights movement at the forefront of that, but also the labor movement and the public employee union movement, the poor people's movement, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian movement. It really was a democratic surge in the 60s. And the fact is that we were perhaps naive to what might well be the rightest reaction. And I've got to tell you, I, people laugh when I say this, but I've got my show and tell again. This is the crisis of democracy report put out by the Trilateral Commission, which was organized by David Rockefeller and members included folks such as George H.W. Bush and James Earl Carter, Jimmy Carter. It was a broad coalition of corporate and political Republican and Democratic folks who feared the Democratic surge. They actually produced this report, and in that they targeted, listen, they targeted American minorities, that is, Blacks and Latinos, public employee unions, women, students, public interest groups, especially environmental groups, value-oriented intellectuals, meaning humanities and social science professors. They said that these folks and their movements had created a democratic distemper in America, a problem of governability, an excess of democracy. And I mention this because we were talking about rigged system. They were afraid that the system that had been long rigged in the favor of the corporate elite and the political elite was going to be directly challenged by a coalition. Please note, coalition of these various movements. And they mobilized powerfully in the 70s, spent a lot of money in terms of media messages, in terms of underwriting politicians, in terms of creating lobbying groups for corporate executives. And what we've seen then is that it was at that time that they captured control by in the Republican Party conservatism, in the Democratic Party neoliberalism. Our problem was, our failing was that the coalition did not coalesce. Now, think today, think today, we are a different generation than the gener I'm of the 60s and 70s generation, but you folks are of a different generation. We have it in our power, Thomas Paine, to begin the world over again, perhaps not as radically as that sounds, but we are on the verge of great possibilities. And what's essential in all of this is that we learn how to create the coalition to make history and the vision that we can surely all grab hold of would be that economic bill of rights. Yeah, oh my God, amen to that. And so I wanna ask this question in the context of FDR. So I'm gonna start with you, Dr. K, and then we're gonna to go to Alan, but this is it. So FDR talked about the relationship between economic freedoms and individual freedoms. How does that really truly apply to our economy today? Does it apply to our economy today? And how does it apply to our economy well, today? I mean, clearly we, we've heard that statistic that a crisis of $400 in a working class family's life could be devastating. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. if that's the case, look, I mean, once upon a time, there were jobs out there that paid, if not a, a really dynamic and great living wage, at least one could create a home and a family. Nowadays, you talk to people and they are working two and three jobs just to make ends meet. Now, that's, as FDR said, needy men and women are not free men and women. Come if on. you are bound to that kind of working life and even then unable to create savings for tomorrow and next year, then how are you going to enjoy, to go back to the founders, life, liberty, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Another way of looking at it is, how are you going to take part 
in civic and democratic life. How are you going to have, and I know you like this, Nia, and I'm going to say it, how are you going to have the adventure that every American should be entitled to? Yes, yes. And, and you know what? So, Doc, I got it here because you and Alan put it, this particular quote in your first op-ed about the 21st century economic bill of rights. Again, go to Common Dreams, baby. You can pick, read this. But here it is, empowered by those findings, FDR declared, quote, we have come to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Necessitous men are not free men. We have accepted, so to speak, a second bill of rights under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station, race, or creed. Alan, I think earlier in quote, you talked about the social benefits are legion. Can we just go right there to the legion? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, the United States of America, again, um, you know, we are a crisis right now. We are a society that has multiple uh, levels of crisis. Um, we have uh, drug addiction uh, is rampant. We have homelessness. We have a tremendous tens of millions probably upwards of 100 million or more Americans living in serious economic precarity that goes to the $400. We have a tricky, if not still failing, education system. Um, we have, on, 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 if you take aggregate wealth uh, as an index out, um, America really ranks at or near the bottom on health outcomes, depression, family structure, uh, all of the prosperous technological societies. By the way, even the technological side of it, we do very poorly in terms of access to broadband internet now. I mean, the investment in, in infrastructure that serves the average household in this country is very weak. Uh, we certainly have a lot of potholes. We also have, for instance, uh, we have basically economic deserts. I mean, we've heard the term food deserts or healthcare deserts. Uh, you know, there's banking deserts. Well, there's economic deserts, and they are in not only a uh, small town in rural America, they tend to be in the centers of large population centers in the United States of America. And everybody knows they're there. They're, they're considered and accept just everybody sees them as unchanging aspects of the social landscape. That is absolutely outrageous. And, it, and, and, and the, the basically social criminality of people accepting that they're just going to continue this way is absurd in a country that has this much wealth That's and right. has the capacity to improve all the infrastructure, to make investments in these communities. Now, look at, look at it this way. If you look at China and the incredible GDP growth in China, and you read the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal, they're going to talk about investment. They're going to talk about the industrial boom. And those things are true. That's a big component of what's happened in China over the past three decades. They also took about 400 million people out of poverty and a peasant class and lifted them up to the middle class. If you took the 80, 100, 120 million Americans and lifted them out of poverty or near poverty, because we all know the poverty line is a ridiculously low line in this country, and lifted them out of poverty by guaranteeing the job with a living wage and the other elements of the 21st century economic bill of rights, the whole society is going to benefit so tremendously on issues across the board. Uh, economic matters and the various social pathologies that are rife in the United States and are not present in South Korea, Japan, Western Europe, and other countries that qualify as technological, industrial, prosperous societies, rich countries, right? These things are not prominent like they are in the United States of America. The, the gain to the whole society when we address those problems, it again, the benefits will be legion across the board and the lives of all Americans will be so tremendously improved. We do not have to be the country that warehouses human beings at a rate unheard of and for such an extended time in all of human history. No country has ever done this, has a prison industrial complex like that. And if anybody, if you want to talk about the failings of, and this is a brilliantly creative society. Yeah. And a lot of the brilliance and creativity comes out of a lot of the, the poor parts of the country. You know, and I don't think that's going to go away. Don't forget, you know, if you bring if you bring difference into contact with each other, I think a lot of creativity sparks off of us. We are now the most diverse country in the history of humanity. That's a, that has a country of spectacular promise. And again, if we just bring about these measures, 
that can provide for everybody inside our society a decent life and a life of opportunity and prosperity. The broad social benefits are off the charts. And since I'm on a riff, if I can just say, I want to clarify, have no illusions. There are three political tendencies vying for power in this country. There's the Trumpian reactionaries over on the right wing of the Republican Party, and they're just the less said about them, the better, right? They're horrible. And then you have in the middle, from the Mitt Romney wing of the Republican Party through the Clinton wing of the Democratic Party, you have the neoliberals. At this hour of history, four decades since Ronald Reagan, they are conservatives. Let's recognize them for what they are. They want to conserve the current order with all of those inequities in place. They really have nothing that pushes them away that changes the fundamental social equations in the United States. Well, now there are the progressive Democrats. They're the progressives following in the lineage of Nina Turner and, and Senator Bernie Sanders, and they represent a positive transformation of the American people. And every American should hear that, and everybody should be invited into our coalition. There it is. I mean, that we welcome all. And I, God, I just the American people have got to know that they're worth it. Mm -hmm. That they are absolutely worth it. And that is our message. You know, one of my favorite uh, ladies singing group was in Vogue. I still love in Vogue. They not they not together doing it like they used to, but that 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 those that was my group. And one of their songs, giving them something he can feel so that he know the love is real, baby. I'm substituting him with giving the people something they can feel so that they will know that the love is real. And what is that love? That love can shine through through public policy. So the mm -hmm. very policies that we are talking about, some of those policies, as we have laid out, have been introduced by progressives who are in that Congress right now. But this kind of wholesale change and visionary provision for the people is not just about what can happen in that Congress. It is about state houses. It is about governor's offices. It is about school boards. It is about city councils. It is every single level of government has a role to play. And I want to add to that every single facet or pillar that is represented in our in our social construct has a role to play so that means corporations have a responsibility and a role to play and what they are doing right now most of them too many of them i won't say all of them but too many of them are making a profit off of other people's misery it is unpatriotic and it is predatory capitalism and we need to put a stop to it hello congress Hello, Congress. Hello, President. I mean, seriously, stop playing footsies with these folks and let them know you are unpatriotic and we're not going to stand for you making a profit off of other people's misery. I, I just don't understand that. And, you know, Alan and Dr. K, I had a boss who used to say all the time, if your hair is on fire, you ought to act like your hair is on fire. And that was Mayor Michael R. White. We ain't play these games. You can't sit up here and be cool, calm, and collected and start clutching pearls and tightening ties. If your hair is on fire, everybody in the room is going to know your hair is on fire because you'd be hopping and skipping around there and trying to find some relief. Well, I mm -hmm. want the po folks of this country to know, baby, our collective hair is on fire and we need some relief. And that relief is the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights, baby. Yes. I know you came back from Washington. I did. From I know you came back from Washington. You should have stayed there. They, they, you should have stayed there and gotten ready for when we send you there. No, I mean, talk I about the student debt question. I mean, you, yes, you, yes. You know, the last debt collective, Dr. K. Let me shout out the debt collective, Astra, and so many of the great leaders and organizations. PDA is a part of that. Uh, the Dream Defenders and others who were there in D.C. Um, my students from Ohio were there and people from all over the country coming together, building that broad based coalition. We're talking about multi generational, multi multi generational, multi ethnic, multi racial, multi identifying folks coming together to say to the president of the United States of America, pick up that pen and cancel student debt. Yeah, maybe I should have stayed there, Dr. K. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, we do want to uh, try to arrange things so that you'll be having an apartment and moving in. Uh, and late 2022 and taking and uh, swearing in in January and all that. Um, look, um, I, I, if I may, if I may, actually, um, you know, 
Dr. Martin Luther King's speeches, I was privileged to work at Pacifica Radio, which has the largest collection of Dr. King's speeches other than the King family themselves, because they actually went out and recorded them back in the day. And so they're in the Pacifica Radio archive. And, and I study these speeches and they are great literature and they are great democratic literature. And this is a significant subset of the inspiring literature that has been produced by Americans has been through the struggle uh, and the movements that uh, Harvey was talking about earlier. And certainly Dr. King is, I mean, if you look at Dr. King and how inspirational those speeches are, and they're tremendous. If anybody, oh, yeah. you know, every, every Martin Luther King holiday, every Martin Luther King birthday, try to listen in to those speeches and you'll have about as great a day as you could possibly have on any given day. And this is one of the reasons we need uh, Nina Turner in Congress. Nina Turner will not just be one congressperson among the 435, because you have a real capacity to articulate for people in the in the tradition of, of, of democratic political um, uh, communication that Dr. King practiced. And it reaches people and it inspires people. And so for those people who are listening right now, uh, please do everything you can, do everything you can to uh, get people to, you know, walk precincts for Senator Turner in this upcoming campaign. And I mean no disrespect even to uh, Nina's uh, in, uh, uh, opponent, but there's just a world of difference, not only in public policy where there's a significant difference, but in terms of a capacity to demand the change our society needs. It simply does not get said in a way that reaches people that Senator Turner can reach people. And that means the communities uh, in Cleveland which need to see social and economic transformation, have an opportunity and a hope to achieve that. And all the poor and impoverished communities across the country and all of the precarious middle class, I'm up now already to 80% of the population, if not beyond. You know, We need a different economic social contract in this society. And we need leaders who have the capacity to reach average people and make sense and also produce the beauty uh, that you see in the great tradition of the great, um, you know, progressive leaders across American history. And Nina Turner, I think we just got to get her into Congress right now. So do everything you can to get her. If I can reinforce what you're saying, mm -hmm. I, I've said this to Nina, I say this every day on Twitter, I say this to everyone. For years, students would ask me, how do we choose between politicians? They all promise stuff. And I said, here's what I would tell you. And I think this is a perfect description of Nina Turner. Don't vote merely for the politicians who promise to fight for you. Vote for the politicians who inspire the fight in you. And all of you who I'm sure are listening right now know exactly what I'm talking about because you will leave tonight inspired to pursue a victory for Nina, a victory for the progressives perhaps in your areas around the country and also to pursue the victory for an economic bill of rights. Well, I love you both for that. And we are definitely all in this together, freedom fighters pushing for a type of life that can be good and can be great. I think decent is, is, is okay, but we're going for good and for great, baby. We're yeah. going to start with decent. We're going to get to decent, but because we're not even at decent yet, Alan. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be a little bit more pointed, if I may, actually. I, did, I, was, I was polite and I was civil in my articulation. But here's the thing about um, the, the sort of political formation that Nina's opponent uh, comes out of. Look, nothing's going to change. If you believe that um, the mainstream of the Democratic Party and the part of the Northeastern Ohio political establishment that Chantel Brown comes out of, are going to really get in there and fight and push and dig up policies and promote the demand that the other 434 members of Congress support those bills. I got a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn and I got a bridge to sell you in Cleveland. And I know of no bridge in Cleveland, even like Brooklyn. So, you know, I'm not selling you anything if you believe that because it's not true. It's status quo politics and it gets us at this hour of our history pretty much nowhere. And, 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 the, and the alternative is visionary and it's gonna fight and it's gonna inspire. So please folks, and, 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 and all the progressives in the country will benefit from a victory by Nina Turner. It's that important to race folks. No, that is, I mean, it means the world to me to have both of you here with me this evening. I am just all, in, all inspired by both of you and so many of the people who are just with us tonight, inspired. I want people to be inspired to know that the power to create a new destiny is definitely in our hands. What do you say, Dr. K, about Thomas Paine? We can 
What's that quote you love? Well, so actually, much? and I'll preface it, I will tell you. Thomas Paine, when he wrote Common Sense, which is the call for revolution in 1776, that led to the Declaration, that led to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as a promise that went unfulfilled and remains unfulfilled to this day. He wrote, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Now, mm -hmm. I, I want you to know that it's really important for everyone to realize that if that resonates in you, that's because that is an American notion. That is an American idea. And I have to tell you, at his darkest moments, Martin Luther King, that was the quote that he would turn to for inspiration. And I'm quoting Dr. Vincent Harding, who, who recorded that. And it's in the book, it's behind me of one of Martin Luther King's books, which was written during one of those dark moments in his life. And he, and he would turn to that quote, and it would remind him of the possibilities that remain within us if we join together to pursue them. Amen. Amen. I think this is a fantastic way for us to end our conversation for tonight. We will continue this because our mission is so high, we can't get over it. Our mission is so low, we can't get under it. And our mission is so wide, we cannot get around it together we can create a different type of America and a different type of world. And there's an intersection for all of us, no matter how we identify, the thing that we have in common is a desire to live a good life. I want you to know, Alan wants you to know, Dr. K wants you to know that you in fact, and all that you love deserves to live a good and fulfilling life and we have the capacity to make that happen both as conscious minded people and we have the resources to do so in these United States of America. So we are, baby, we are going to keep the faith and we are definitely going to keep the fight until next time. And there will be a next time, baby. Take good care of yourselves and we'll see you again real soon. Thank you. Alan, director, executive director, Alan of PDA. Look up PDA, Alan. Tell, give everybody all the particulars about PDA. All the social medias. Are very, the social, media. social media is very simple. At PD America on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And then PDAmerica.org if you want to contact them. Us at info at PDAmerica.org. Same ending there as the website. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, thank and you, Dr. K, you. how can we find you? Well, I'm on Twitter regularly at Harvey, yes, J-K-A-Y-E. And beyond that, um, you can find me hanging out as much as I can promoting Nina Turner online. <laughs> I appreciate that, Doc. <laughs> and listen, join PDA. Get involved. Join PDA and you can join another organization too. There are many great organizations out there, both progressive led organizations and other civic based organizations. But what you cannot do is sit on the sidelines and a representative of democracy, baby. We got to get in it to win it. All right, sending you all kinds of love. Until next time. <laughs>